It's great to be here today, and um, I wanted to thank Marina and Deborah for setting up this event. Uh, one of the most fun things about arriving at UCSD is that almost every day since I've arrived here, somebody has sent me an email saying, hey, I, I got this idea, do you want to uh, grab lunch and talk about it? And so most of the days since I've been here, I've gotten a chance to talk with uh, students and researchers and other people about their work, which has just been a really warm welcome for me. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about a shift that I've seen in human-computer interaction and design over the past couple of years. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the story uh, through the design studio. Um, many of you may have taken an art or design course at some point, and uh, I think that art and design studios can teach us a lot about project-based learning. And an uh, important lesson has to do with physical space. On the left is a photograph that I took of the product design loft at Stanford. And you can see here how all of the stuff that people working, are working on is visible to everybody else that's there. And so the upside down umbrella and the Barbie dolls and the shoes and the glue gun. And so if you want to know who's an expert in something, uh, if you want to know when people shift course or start on a new project, uh, if you want to know how things evolve over time, all of that is available to you just by looking around. Um, and this technology was introduced with the founding of the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris in 1819. And it's endured for nearly 200 years, I think because of the powerful affordances for co-location, collaboration, peer critique. Interestingly, design isn't the only field that, that offers this. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Brown University, there was a single computer room where everybody worked. And it was an amazing space for community building and learning because you were shoulder to shoulder with all of the other students. And so as a first semester freshman, you could see what you might work on as a master student taking computer graphics. And when you were taking data structures and got stuck, you could lean over and ask to the person next to you for help. Uh, or they could give you help. And that was a great way for students to learn from each other and to build up knowledge. And my friend, Carrie Karahelios, told me that when MIT got rid of their equivalent space, the Athena cluster, it had a really detrimental effect on, uh, on the community. And I think in many ways, one of the worst things to happen to computer science education has been the advent of uh, cheap laptops. But uh, that's also been a, a major advantage as well. And so we're going to see that also in this talk. And I wanted to share with you just two projects from my group that illustrate a shift that we're seeing in design that's enabled by uh, network computing and the spread of digital technologies. Um, and the first one is uh, my postdoc at the time, Stephen Dow and I, we're interested in uh, studying prototyping and trying to understand what are the active ingredients of prototyping and can we give people advice on, on how to do that better? Can we induce a process shift that will reliably help people produce more creative, higher quality work? And uh, the first thing that we settled on was we built a, an egg drop contraption. So uh, many of you have probably built these. If you haven't, let me show you how it works. Is you take something like this, uh, it's made out of uh, household materials. We throw it out of, in this case, my third story office window, drops on the ground, and this egg actually survives. This was made by a product design student. Um, anecdotally, the best people that we tested on this were the product design students, and the worst that we tested on this were those from the theoretical wing of mechanical engineering, which is kind of funny that the two halves of the, the same department had the, the two outliers. And what was interesting is um, we interviewed people at the end about why they did what they did and, and how they chose their design. There are about five or six major strategies that you can employ for something like this. And what we saw is um, people picked one idea and really ran with it, uh, and they realized that. So I'm going to play for you a short video if we can have sound here. Um, this is, and if not, we have subtitles. But uh, if there is sound here, that would be great. Or I can do this. Um, for some reason, this, is, this seems to be the only idea. And there needs to be a platform, and then it's going to cushion as possible with the materials. I, I, I don't see any, uh, any other way. I'm not a very 
good outside the box thinker, so I kind of just had one idea and I was going to try and make it work. Um, I kind of went with the whole parachute idea and the, what I had from the beginning. So this is the best approach for such a design. <laughs> And it's amazing, right? Because we've all been there. Every single one of us has been the person who's working on a design project, and you can't think of another thing to make. And in the moment, you kind of feel like it's not only am I working on the best way, but this is the only way that it could be. And this is an example of what the psychologist Carl Dunker called functional fixation. Uh, in the 40s, he gave people all sorts of creativity problems, like this one here, where, we, where he asked people to affix the candle to the wall such that none of the wax drips on the table. And I bet many of you who have seen this before know the solution, uh, which is that you dump out the tax and you put the box on the wall and that serves as a catch basin for all of the wax. And what's interesting about this is if you give people the problem as formulated on the left, about 20% of people come up with a solution. But if you give people the exact same problem only where the tax are dumped out of the box to begin with, almost everybody comes up with it at the very beginning. And so a subtle shift in framing can produce a dramatic change in, in results. So we were curious, could we come up with a process change that was a fixation antidote in, uh, in a general sense? And we moved from studying egg drop contraptions, throwing them out my window, to uh, the web. And this, for us, was a big opportunity. Uh, for starters, it meant that my computer science colleagues no, th no longer thought I was crazy for throwing crepe paper out the window all the time. Um, but more importantly, what we saw on the web was that we were able to, over the course of several years, uh, we ran several million ads on the major ad networks. And we were able to get click data and other metrics that were real users doing real tasks, oblivious to the existence of an experiment. And that was a powerful measurement technique for us. In this particular study, what we did is we asked people to either uh, design a set of ads in serial, design an ad, get feedback, design an ad, get feedback, design an ad, get feedback, or do it in parallel, where they would come up with three, then get feedback on all three, uh, and then make two more, get feedback on those, and then make a final ad. Total amount of time was the same, and this is important because when we go to industry and we say, we have a better idea for how you can do design, they'll say, look, Scott, I'm sure your idea is better, but we just don't have that kind of time in industry. That's not how the real world works. So we keep the time constant uh, and the amount of feedback, the number of things they're making. And what we see is people make all sorts of stuff. Some of the ideas are great, some are terrible, some are cookie cutter, others are really outside the box. And if you aggregate over all of them, what you see is that people that are assigned to the parallel design approach produced ads that real users on the web, oblivious to the existence of an experiment, clicked on at a significantly higher rate. And more than that, they spent more than two and a half times on the site once they got there. This is important uh, because you could make an ad that says free iPad. Lots of people might click, but it wouldn't be very relevant. And so we're seeing that we're not only getting more users, but we're getting better users. Uh, we also saw higher experts gave higher ratings who are blind to condition. Uh, and interestingly, people also produced more diverse designs as well. When we saw this benefit for individual work, we were curious about could we extend this strategy to group work? And uh, so we, we ran a similar study where we had people work in, in pairs, in dyads. And what we saw is that when we asked people to share multiple designs, there was a huge benefit uh, over sharing only a single design. And these benefits showed up in many different ways. So what we saw is that people explored more individually, they shared more features, they took more conversational turns, we achieved better consensus. Uh, and most interesting to me, there was an increase in group rapport. So if you ask people, how good are you feeling about your team collaboration? In the share multiple case, that went up, whereas in the share one case, that went down. And um, by running these studies on the web uh, and, and the scale that, that came out of that, um, we were following in the footsteps of a, a recent trend I've seen in, in industry where in my field of uh, human-computer interaction, it used to be the case that when you were building software, when you got most of the way done, you would bring some people into the lab, you'd have somebody try it, and when they got stuck, they would swear. You'd write down where that was, and after they left, you would fix that usability bug. Then you'd bring the next person in. And you'd do that a couple of times until you ran out of time or money. 
and then you'd release. And once you released, you had no idea what anybody did with your software. But online, you have the opportunity to both release early and also to compare multiple different alternatives and gather metrics about how that performance is, is working. And so that's been a big shift in the professional field, and we can harness that for science. And that's exactly what we did uh, in the case of Chin Michael Carney's work. Chin Mai is, I just saw him, oh, right there. So Chin Mai is, uh, it's really dark. I can't actually see anybody. Um, and Chin Mai is a PhD student who's been working with me on peer assessment. When I started teaching design, uh, this is the first design class I taught at Stanford. I was excited about the studio as I shared with you at the beginning. And we brought a studio-based practice to a computer science course in the School of Engineering. And uh, on the whole, things worked great. But there was one aspect of the course that students rated terribly. The question, how fair is the grading, was in the 13th percentile. And I think for many of you who have taught project-based courses, especially in an engineering school where people are used to more right or wrong answers, it's seven and not five, um, you can see why this would be. I think it's difficult to assess project-based work. Um, but design isn't arbitrary. I mean, the truth value may be less crisp than five versus seven, but it's not random. And so I wanted to be able to convey to students um, what it was that we were after. And that made me realize a profound shift in teaching design is that um, there's a big difference between being a good player of knowing how to do something and being a good coach of being able to articulate what it is that you're doing and share that with somebody else. And of course, the teacher is the coach. Um, but that's not a skill that, that you know, those of us uh, who got, came up through the PhD system necessarily were trained in. And so over a period of several years, I built a number of materials for being able to convey to students what is good design for each of the assignments that they're doing. And these are extremely powerful learning aids. You see one example of a, a rubric uh, at the bottom here. And so it lays out what the goals of the assignment are and, and what constitutes success. And in this particular class, we have a weekly deliverable. So students submit work uh, every Thursday night. And then on Friday, they come in, share work in studio. And they will, at the end of studio, self-assess their own work. We carve out the last five minutes for students to pop open their laptops and assess how they did in their work uh, that week. And then uh, at the end of Friday, the staff and I gather together, and we produce a staff grade for everybody as well. Uh, if the grades are close, students get their own grade. And um, if they don't, they get the staff grade. So this is a kind of uh, self-assessment with bumpers. And you may realize, uh, if there's any game theorists in the audience, uh, you may realize that there's a, a trick here, which is that you say, aha, if I get my own grade, I'm, if I'm close, and a student came up to me after class one day and shared this with me, he said, well, I could game the system, this is really unfair, because I could game the system by artificially inflating my grade and giving myself an unfairly higher grade. Um, and, and he was really worried about this, but uh, for me, not so much. I went into class the next day and explained this worry. Uh, and shared how um, if you have the ability to think about what your, uh, the person grading you will assess your work as, and you can do that consistently and reliably week after week, that theory of mind skill of knowing how you'll be evaluated is so useful in the real world um, that it's more than worth the four and a half points uh, that you would get by, by doing this gaming if you did it completely perfectly. Because of course, if you go too far, it, it doesn't work. And what's remarkable is that we see that by the end of the class, uh, about 80% of students are getting their own grades. It creeps up over the quarter. It starts at about half and, and goes up. And what we see is that the, um, the results that we, we've got here are pretty consistent with the, the prior studies in the peer assessment literature is that high pro and self-assessment literature is that high-performing students underrate, low-performing students overrate. There are several things going on here. One is, uh, in the American context, it's not cool to overly shout yourself as, you know, I'm really great, I'm an A-plus student, uh, and people are similarly uncomfortable saying, you know, I'm a D-minus student. Um, but I think another thing that's going on is that high-performing students have high standards for themselves. 
and low-performing students have low standards for themselves. And one outcome of this activity is that it reflects back to the students uh, what it is that, that's happening. And um, in this way, when we put students more in charge of assessment for themselves, it really gratifyingly shifts the teaching role from being a judge to becoming a coach. Because it, the less that I'm involved in the score that's being produced, if I'm no longer grading the papers, but simply coaching students to do the best work that they can, that's, I think, both a more effective role for a teacher and, and it's more personally rewarding for me. Uh, lots of other people have used these materials for, for their HCI classes. Um, and a couple of years ago, we had an opportunity to um, put this HCI class online. Um, my, my friends Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng uh, asked me if I wanted to teach my HCI class online. Uh, and I said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. That'd be really fun. Uh, but of course, you know, there's no way that uh, we could do the project at scale. That would be just crazy. So we're just going to do the, the lectures, and we'll have some quizzes or something like that. And then I came down and I visited uh, San Diego. And I spent some time with Ed Hutchins, who showed me the peer assessment work that he was doing. Uh, he spoke in this series last year. And he's done amazing work in his cognitive science classes using peer assessment for pretty sophisticated stuff. And uh, Ed gave me the courage to uh, try peer assessment on a massive scale. And so we took a variant of the calibrated peer assessment process that Ed's been using, and we implemented it in an online context. Uh, and it's since been used in more than 100 massive online classes in all sorts of domains. The way that it works, uh, I bet many of you are familiar with this, is that students see a calibration assignment uh, that they, it is pre-graded so they can get feedback on how well they're using the rubric to grade. Then they'll go out and they'll assess five peers. One of those, unbeknownst to them, is a staff graded assignment which gives us ground truth for how well it's going. And then at the end of assessing the peers, they'll assess themselves. And we have some evidence that doing self-assessment specifically at the end is the right time because you're in more of an evaluative frame. Um, one thing that's interesting is that if you move from, you know, at the point where you submit the assignment, you're often not so much thinking about all of the evaluation criteria that will be used. And um, after you've assessed a bunch of peers and you've been like, well, that wasn't so good, and that wasn't so good, and that wasn't so good, oh, that's pretty cool, I didn't think about doing that. Then you go and see your own work, and it's easier both to be critical, well, you know, that wasn't as good as I thought, um, but also be, be more excited about the, the things that you did well. And so um, that's been extremely cool to see. And what we find is that online peers are able to assess each other well enough that you can support a project-based uh, pass-fail class uh, pretty darn well. So we have six assignments over the course of the online class. It's running now for the fourth time. Uh, over the four runs, we've had about 160,000 signups. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been pretty widely adopted. Um, now, um, I don't want to give just a, just a booster talk. And so I want to give you ex some examples of when uh, peer assessment fails. And this is my favorite one. I got permission from uh, a friend of a friend to share this email that was, that was written to a friend of mine ranting uh, about peer assessment. And uh, <laughs> it says, I didn't get a certificate. I'm really pissed off. I put a lot of time and effort into this. The course was uh, just to extract re research information. Uh, I'm not a fan of online learning, damn peer review. It's just a bunch of students making things fit into a rubric like a check sheet, like talking about dog poop. What is this world coming to? <laughs> and um, what happened was that this student was gung-ho uh, about the class they were taking. It wasn't my class. It was a different one. And they got crummy peer feedback, and they ended up just shy of a certificate. And so you can see how you know, the Gaussian that I showed where there's a big mass in the middle, well, there are also outliers. And if you're working, what, and we, we've subsequently looked at the data, and we can see that if you end up getting really crummy uh, peer review feedback, that is the major reason why students in a, in a peer, peer assessed class will, uh, will drop the course. And just recently, uh, Chinmay went to India to get his visa renewed, and he walked in for his visa interview 
And the consular officer had taken a bunch of Coursera classes with peer assessment. And so he spent his visa interview talking shop about, uh, about his research, which is a pretty good way to get your visa renewed. Uh, it was pretty cool. Quantitatively, what we see is that um, students find one of the most valuable things about the class as being the activity of assessing their peers' work and assessing their own work. Uh, and that was extremely cool for me because I think sometimes the popular press likes to talk about peer assessment in terms of this is an efficient way to scale grading, which is true. But I think the more fundamental shift is that uh, it really enables students both individually and collectively to take charge of their learning experience. And you learn a lot by the process of doing assessment. I had a wonderful middle school math teacher, and he used to tell me that uh, teaching is learning, and the first person you teach is, is yourself, and the next person you teach is, is, is your friend next to you. And we're seeing the benefits of that here. Um, people like to, uh, people found different reasons for why they like self and peer assessment. Um, so people valued being able to see other people's work and different points of views and comparing their own work to it. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was really cool to see. In the original version of the, uh, of the class, we used the median of five grades as the uh, grade that was given to students. And subsequently, Chris Peach and colleagues uh, designed an adaptive algorithm uh, that in an expectation maximization-like way, it looks collectively at the set of scores given out. We have, a, we have a set of noisy sensor readings you can think of them as. And we're trying to infer what the true grade is that these noisy sensors are trying to approximate. And using machine learning techniques, uh, if you infer a greater bias and then account for that, uh, you can produce much higher quality results. And Chinmai and colleagues have built an open source peer assessment server that now incorporates this, uh, this adaptive grading strategy. The other thing that we've seen is that giving people feedback about how well their grading is going is a really valuable strategy because you know you grade your peers and you want to know well how well they do and if you tell people oh you're running a little hot you're running a little cold you're doing great that is super useful and students will account for it in the future interestingly at this just high low neutral level they overshoot so people who run hot will subsequently run cold though not by as much um, and uh, over the time, we'll, we'll self-correct. If you give people more detailed feedback about how much they're running hot or cold by, that improves things further. So far, we've been talking entirely about numerical scores. And one of the things that, uh, that we've done is we've added what we call fortune cookies, which are short prompts that are generalized feedback that is broadly applicable. And what we see is that these short prompts um, are a great way for students to give feedback to peers, which can be difficult if you're a novice. I mean, one, there's kind of an intrinsic tension in peer assessment, which is that if you're in the class, you are definitionally a novice, which means that you don't actually have the skill to uh, yet to understand the work. And what we're trying to do, what the, the class in general is trying to do, is move you from being a novice in the domain to being competent in the domain. And one of the scaffolds that's valuable for that is to give examples of commonly relevant feedback. And so you employ a time-honored HCI principle of converting a uh, recall task, coming up with something from a clean slate, into a recognition task, looking at a list and saying, that one. Just recently, we've been doing some experiments on um, trying different strategies for um, both integrating human and algorithmic assessment, and also based on the crowdsourcing literature, uh, being able to try different strategies of assessment. And uh, my friend Michael Bernstein has done some really nice work on crowdsourcing with a design pattern called Find, Fix, Verify for things like essay improvement, uh, breaking up crowd workers' tasks into different kinds of work improves the outcome. And we've seen that with assessment as well. So inspired by and in collaboration with Michael, um, what we did is we said, well, some people are going to be um, identify people. So we'll give you a bunch of assignments, 
and you'll identify a bunch of features that those assignments have. And then later in the verify phase, you'll see assignments that have a set of attributes listed and you get to decide, do these, are these attributes correctly applied or not? Uh, and this is an example of that. So you can see a, a question and the attributes that were marked. Uh, and uh, then what the rater does is the rater will say, uh, yep, those are the right ones. And then the student will see this feedback. Uh, and it, it, uh, it works extremely well. And you can combine uh, machine learning grades with human grades to reduce the grader burden uh, and, and deliver on the whole really high quality results. We've also been, boy, does anybody know what that chirping sound is? At first I thought it might be a... Yeah. Have some agency. I bet it's a robot. Um, one of the, uh, the, one thing that we explored recently was doing early feedback. So if you do a big project and then you get a grade, that can be really frustrating if the grade is not what you hope for. Of course, if you're really looking at the rubric, you shouldn't be totally surprised. However, sometimes you may know that your work is not good, but not know how to get there. And so one thing that uh, Chinmay and Ed Hutchins and I had lunch today to talk about, how can we integrate early feedback, uh, either algorithmically or peer-based instruction, to before the assignment is submitted, uh, give people some cues. And uh, stay tuned for, for results on that, or if you're interested in collaborating with that or not. Uh, we came up with a plan today for, for Ed's winter quarter class that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Um, and one thing that you can do is you can have algorithms. Uh, Chinmai and I were curious whether we could build a bozo detector. I've realized that the bottom 15% of students in my classes in person um, really don't get much out of it, um, and it's probably not good for them. But they also chew up a lot of instructor resources. And in a team project class, uh, can be a real nightmare for their teammates to deal with. And so we were curious, could we, based on your experience in the first two weeks of class, so the first 12 days, could we guess whether it's likely that you're going to be a bozo at the end of the quarter? And what we will do then is we'll say, uh, hey, just want to let you know, based on what you're doing right now, you know, the early warning signs are it's not going to go well. So you might want to think about either shaping up, uh, which would be great, or if this isn't your cup of tea, uh, maybe you want to ship out. And um, we designed a bozo detector before the last round of my in-person class at Stanford. Um, and then at the end of the class, we looked at, had we used that, uh, what was the confusion matrix of our ability to find bozos? And what we're seeing is that uh, we have the ability to find people who are in the bottom 20% 20 20 of the class uh, with 85% accuracy. And so I think it's very likely that this winter we're going to try this out um, after the first two weeks. We've been looking at trying to understand how peer assessment works, not just in, in, uh, in my own classes, but also across a number of different domains. And so these are some of the classes that have used peer assessment that we have analyzed the data for. And you see they're extremely diverse, mathematical proofs, organizational analysis, writing, nutrition, world music, design, uh, all sorts of stuff. And what we found is that peer assessment doesn't automatically work. Uh, and uh, I think we got lucky with the HCI class uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and what we see is that classes that do peer assessment well have really strong outcomes, whereas those that do it poorly, I mean, you just get total gibberish. And you can find in the blogosphere uh, a bunch of people ranting about uh, the classes where it hasn't worked so well. And in analyzing all of these classes, we've distilled uh, what I call the seven habits of highly successful peer assessment which was the campiest title I could come up with and hope that it would uh, have impact. And what we're seeing here is it's extremely important to have uh, assignment-specific rubrics. Remember, we have novices, not experts, definitionally. And so you can't say, well, here are general attributes of a good essay or proof or something else. It's important to have them be, in this proof about De Morgan's laws, 
this is what we're looking for and this would be an error. Iteration is extremely important. All of us coming from design know the power of iterative design. Equally true in the learning world. Uh, and you can either do that like I've done where I taught my class in person um, starting as a small class and growing it over the years uh, before releasing it online uh, so that the online version had the benefit of six years of iteration. Um, or you can do what my friend Dan Russell did, which is pilot test on a small number of users before release. And I was talking with Don Norman this past weekend, and he's doing that now for his Design of Everyday Things course, uh, which arose out of his time here, which is very cool. Do self-assessment at the end after peer assessment, and use staff grades to provide ground truth. Otherwise, you're flying blind, and you have no idea how well peer assessment is working. Uh, aggregate grades adaptively to produce higher quality results and use the cued prompts, the fortune cookies, to provide written feedback. Uh, and then close the loop, let people know how well they did. One of the most remarkable things about teaching online is how much students made the class theirs. This is not a I give lectures to the world, world consumes them experience at all. And uh, the forums just light up with all kinds of activity. And uh, people share all sorts of stuff. For example, uh, one student took every reading mentioned in the class and curated an Amazon list. I assume they get a few cents on each sale, so maybe this is a micro business among other things. But it's a really great learning resource. Uh, we've been encouraging Twitter use recently. And uh, it's been really fun to see the Twitter feed. And the night before the deadline, students are uh, tweeting, talking about what they're working on, and providing uh, support and all sorts of stuff. And we launched a LinkedIn group just for students who achieved a certificate uh, in the class. And it's a really active, people ask for feedback about, hey, what kind of tools are you using? Or uh, there's been a ton of activity lately about people's thoughts on gestural interfaces. And uh, when new technology comes out, people will review it from an HCI perspective. It's extremely cool. And there are also some really sophisticated learning materials that students are producing and sharing. Uh, this is a better summary of one of my lectures than anything I was able to produce. And uh, that's really, it's amazing to see somebody distill something that, um, that I was explaining it in a much better way than I could have, which is really cool. And some of these projects go on and have a real life of their own. And uh, one example is, uh, uh, this is a, a student who went on to become a community TA, Chandra Muli, uh, who went from a paper prototype and early designs in my class to something that's being used by the UN in a number of different locations, which is just totally amazing. Now, um, I think this really strongly contrasts with a worry that a lot of people have about online education, that it's just being alone together, that there's a million people around the world individually glued to their computer. Uh, my grandfather doesn't use the internet because he, 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 he has observed that among his friends it just causes them to isolate themselves. And a lot of the students that are taking online classes uh, are a different cohort than we see in in-person classes, which is why I think they're, they're really complementary. That if you're an 18-year-old uh, and extremely talented, a UC is a wonderful option. But for a lot of the rest of the world, uh, whether you're, I mean, it, it can be as simple as no longer in college, access to classes like this, and a community of other people who are excited about ideas uh, is really tricky. And as we think about designing community technologies for online education, uh, I take a lot of inspiration from uh, my colleague here, Jim Holland's work on Beyond Being There. This is a paper that I've taught in my graduate class uh, since I created it nine years ago. And Jim's insight, which emerged uh, concurrently with the early web, is that the best technologies for collaboration online are ones that leverage what's unique about the online world, rather than trying to merely replicate uh, the physical world. So you don't want to have a website that looks like a, a man cave or whatever that is there. Uh, you want to use the web for, for what the web's good at. And one of those things is that we see a lot of new and diverse perspectives online that won't show up as much in a physical university classroom. For example, uh, in my design class, I teach participant observation and need finding. Go out and 
uh, find potential users and other stakeholders, watch their current practices, and build technologies that integrate with their, their goals, dreams, and values. And totally valuable, great, great activity. Uh, the first time I taught online, message pops up on the message board. Uh, my mobility limitations mean that I'm restricted to my house. How can I do this kind of need finding online? Totally cool question. Uh, and so my, my TAs and I brainstormed a bunch of ways that you could do participation and observation uh, from your own computer, uh, virtual ethnography, as it's often called, and, uh, and shared those online. And so that, that's just one of many examples of how the community shift here uh, makes teaching really rewarding. We've been exploring students uh, who are talking about uh, their coursework in small group discussions using a software system that, that Chinmai made called TalkAbout. So we, students can hop online uh, when they're in a class and using uh, study guides basically for small group discussions, uh, talk about activities in, uh, in a bunch of different classes. Uh, and so we've used it in five classes now, uh, and it's worked differentially well across, across different classes for many of the same reasons as peer assessment. Uh, and it's ironic given how I think successful peer assessment was for the HCI class that when we deployed talk about uh, in my own class, we screwed it up. We did it wrong. Uh, we didn't follow our own advice, and consequently, it hasn't been used very much. Uh, conversely, Scott Plaus, who teaches social psychology, uh, and Dan McFarland, who teaches organizational analysis, have really used this group discussion resource well in their class, uh, and you see lots of cool stuff. So um, this is some of the students' forum reports afterwards. And um, what's amazing is that in these voluntary sessions, students spend an hour or more uh, talking with peers around the globe. And um, because the, the underlying technology platform we use is Google Hangouts, uh, which aren't available in uh, Iran and a few other places, uh, we encourage people to meet up either online or offline. And we've had several thousand choose both options. Um, and people see differential benefits. I think uh, one thing that people talk about in the online world that they really like is it feels like a mini UN. In Scott's class, you talk about hot button social psychological issues, racism, sexism, homophobia. And having a global discussion is a really powerful experience for the students that participate. Um, and, and they saw less of that diversity uh, in person. Uh, on the other hand, there's, also, there's all of the obvious benefits of being physically co-located that, that appeal to students that go that route. Uh, this is correlational data, but we've seen some evidence that students who engage in talk about and participate in diverse groups uh, do better in, uh, in terms of uh, final course performance. And uh, we're currently running a number of studies. If this is something that, uh, that you're interested in, uh, I'd love to talk with you more about it. So to close, I wanted to think about this shift that we're seeing in design at large of moving from uh, small scale empirical work uh, to both larger scale and embedded directly in authentic real world usage and in ways that are sometimes a little bit subversive. And I think there are big opportunities here at UCSD for, for research and design uh, in a world that moves from six people into the lab to, to thousands online. Um, and I think in particular we see a synergy of things that are um, a lot of the design things that we're looking at are things that blend the physical, the computational, and the, and the cultural. And one example is uh, last Friday I had lunch with Gad Shannon who directs uh, Gadlight, a design consultancy. And he gave me permission to show you his upcoming new project, which is really cool. Uh, it is a device for measuring uh, blood sugar level. Uh, for diabetics, and so you can see how that works here as you press a button, you prick your finger, an integrated sensor reads it, and then you see your blood sugar level, boom, right there. And this is a perfect example of a new kind of design where the skills to be able to pull this off, uh, he leads a team of 14 in-house right in La Jolla here. And there are, you know, the computer scientist, the mechanical engineer, and also a deep understanding of 
people's lives because especially for devices like health, if it doesn't fit into your life, you're not gonna use it. And it can track through your iPhone and all sorts of things. It works well for kids, um, really cool. Another project of his that I wanted to show in collaboration with Qualcomm is the, uh, the new Qualcomm smartwatch. Wearable computing uh, both is requiring a very different skill set than old school computer science did. Um, in terms of things, for example, they innovated on uh, wireless charging, but the constraints for wearable computing are, are also really different. So it's not only that you're fi figuring out the form factor, you have to ask, uh, is it fashionable? Am I gonna actually wear this? Which is a big sea change. Now, these are things that are done by uh, small groups of highly trained professionals. I mean, just the, the best people in their field. Um, it's possible to do this with student teams too. This is a, a startup called Delight that emerged out of the Stanford Design School where a team of three students uh, reimagined opportunities for lighting in the developing world to reduce the dependence on oil-based lamps, uh, which are uh, carcinogens among other things. And so um, the, the numbers of, of, they've now sent seven million of these out into the world. Uh, and they actually have a program running right now to support uh, victims of the recent typhoon in the Philippines for $37. You can send one of their lights to the, uh, to the Philippines and it's, um, they're distributing them there for free. So that's a really cool. Uh, and a lot of my thinking about uh, these opportunities has come from uh, my former graduate students who have gone and, uh, and started companies and so that, that explore these ideas. So these include uh, Mike Krieger who started, uh, co-founded Instagram uh, and um, let's see, we have Neil Patel who started uh, Awas Day. It's a voice-based uh, social network system and Akshay Kothari uh, who co-founded Pulse. It was a news reader that was shown on stage when the iPad released. Uh, Joel Brandt uh, who's uh, uh, with the Brackets open source system, uh, Ranjita Kumar, who has a, a data-driven web design tool, Ron Ye, who built the uh, iPhone app, uh, Tiny Piano, uh, Chinmai's work here, uh, Nicholas Kokalis, who has a gaming company. All of these are leveraging the potential of uh, design at scale and are doing so in a way that um, is pretty interesting in terms of how it, it changes people's everyday lives as well. And so this fall, we started a, a seminar series to explore a bunch of these issues. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank Jackie, who's here, who has been the administrative support for this seminar series. And there's no way that uh, I would have been able to do this without her. And also uh, Doug Ramsey and Scott Blair, uh, who designed the awesome website for this seminar series. Um, th that's been really amazing. Uh, and of course, uh, Ramesh Rao for hosting me both in my office uh, and the seminar series is hosted here in, in Atkinson. And uh, we have one more talk this year. Uh, Marty Hurst is gonna come on December 5th to talk about um, her online education experiences. And it's brand new work, uh, and she wasn't ready to talk about it yet, but I, I really twisted her arm to come and, and speak because it's super exciting. And so we struck a deal where that one's not gonna be videotaped. So if you wanna hear the latest, you gotta come in person. But all the others are, and the talks are all uh, up online. They've been, they've been really cool, and they've helped me think through uh, a number of these ideas. Um, and after Darren Gurgle from Northwestern came, uh, he, he sent me this slide to include in this talk of, Darren's perspective on, you know, as design scales up and is engaged with the world, uh, it's extremely important to think about, uh, well, who has access to the information? How do we retain diverse perspectives uh, so that it's not just becoming one TV channel? Um, if we're gonna incorporate algorithms into scale-based systems, uh, what are the biases that they have and what role do they play? Uh, and, and Darren, in, in his talk uh, about a month ago, beautifully pointed out how we need new tools and methods to be able to explore uh, these issues. And we need new faculty. Uh, cognitive science has a position in design this year. Um, if you know anybody who is interested, uh, we explicitly wrote the position that it can be joint with other departments. And so if you have people who are applying to maybe a search in your department and you see opportunities for synergy, uh, definitely talk to me. We interpret this position to be uh, as broad as we can get away with. We're, we're hoping to hire somebody who's just uh, extremely cool and exciting. 
And to bring it back to, to the local campus, um, to conclude, this is uh, uh, I, my recommendation for one thing that, uh, that we can do is ask your local building manager for uh, a socket wrench, both a physical one and a metaphorical one. Uh, I've been amazed at uh, everywhere I've, I've been a student and taught, uh, outside the professional schools, uh, nearly every uh, large classroom has the chairs bolted down, which makes it extremely difficult to do project-based activities in class. And Beth Simon and others have been doing yeoman's work on uh, doing flipped classroom activities here. Um, this is one space I like a lot. I gave the computer science colloquium at Harvard uh, a couple months ago. And Eric Mazur showed me around uh, a space that they transformed there. And what's notable about a lot of this classroom change is there's nothing fancy. There's no whiz-bang displays or sensors, or there's no part in here that costs a lot of money, uh, except that somehow universities have to pay more for tables than they should. But <laughs> you, know, you could basically go get this whole thing from Ikea, and all you have to do is uh, pull out the chairs and set up some more flexible space. And, uh, it, it makes a big difference. Um, if anybody knows good teaching spaces, uh, uh, Christo and Lilia Rani are teaching a class in winter that is badly in need of a studio space, as am I. I have uh, 100 people on the wait list for my class because we can't find a room to teach in. It's, uh, it's really killer. And I mean this metaphorically, too, that uh, the reason that uh, when I joined here, uh, I, I worked really hard to be in Atkinson Hall is because I value the, the interdisciplinary collaborations that we see here. And I think there's huge power if we unbolt our metaphorical departmental chairs and move into an interdisciplinary co-located space. So getting to meet folks like uh, Deborah and Albert Lin, who's been using crowdsourcing in really new and exciting ways, uh, has been extremely powerful. Um, and so I encourage you to uh, join us in this design at large exploration. And uh, we have lots of open source software to try. And I'm happy to take any questions. And I can't see for beans. And so if you have, uh, well, I can see well normally. But the, the lights mean that I can't see past the first three rows. So uh, speak into the microphone. Hey, Christo, I can see that row. Thanks for this talk. Um, so I have a question about uh, with the peer review part. Yeah. And you were talking about, um, later you were talking about the kind of lesson of not just trying to replicate online what you know, might be the practice offline. And you showed the kind of man cave web design from early on, right? Has, have you played around at all with trying to do that with peer assessment so that the gold standard or the ground truth isn't just the kind of, uh, I think you called it the staff grader. Like, is there, I mean, I just think about like the gold standard might be flawed and maybe we can do better, um, especially in areas where there's a lot of debate over what quality is. And I, I'm thinking of like Kai reviews right now and everybody going crazy about, I got a really great review and a terrible review and both people are supposedly qualified, right? So uh, can we do better than the kind of gold standard of, of staff somehow? Yeah. Using, using new affordances. I, uh, I, think, I think you're totally right. And um, I think that um, one major opportunity that I see, uh, that, that Chinmay and Ed and I were talking about at lunch today, is that um, the, there, are two, well, there, there are many, but two things that are frustrating about the cadence of a normal university class is that the class sweeps along at its pace, no matter what your interests are or abilities or anything else. Uh, and so, uh, as Salman Khan and others have, have really eloquently argued for, mastery learning, where you go at your own pace that's more driven by your own interests and that's uh, relative to your current abilities, is a, is a much more powerful strategy. And so, one major hope that I have as we reimagine the, the university in the 21st century, is that we move away from the you know lockstep uh, you know new concepts come at a fixed pace and there's nothing you can do about it to something where we give students a lot a lot more flexibility. Um, 
And, and I do think that, I mean, one, there are lots of opportunities for seeing diverse perspectives through things like peer assessment. One thing that, that Chinmai discovered is uh, we've seen a patriotism bias in assessments so that uh, people rate, uh, even though they're anonymous, submissions from their home geographic region more highly than others. And I, I, not by a lot, but by a little, uh, which you know, at that, that scale is, uh, is really notable. And um, reasons for this include things like there was a design submission by a student from New Zealand who had a cool mobile phone bicycle lane finding system. And somebody where, from a place where there are a lot less bicycle lanes says, what do you need this for? You just ride your bike wherever you need to. What's this whole bike lane thing about? And uh, so getting to see how people from around the world react is powerful. And I think in many ways, the, the most useful part of peer assessment is not, not the numerical score, but the, the qualitative feedback. And, and I definitely think that um, moving to a model where you know, the thing that we foreground is the, is the qualitative part. And maybe there's still a score because you need it for various reasons, um, but that that's less of, less of the focus. Yeah, I think there's a hand in the back. Thank you. So I'm looking at when we, we do reports and we do a lot of drafts. And so when I grade something, I give the numerical score, but also I circle, you know, this is good, you know, and this one, you know, is bad. And so I, w I wasn't sure if you did qualitative, but I guess you do. And I wondered how much effort do students really put in in terms of helping the other person do a better job? And I don't know if they iterate on it, like they turn in draft one and draft two and just comment on how much, because it takes more effort to give qualitative feedback than it does just to rate. Absolutely, I mean, peer assessment takes a lot of time, and one challenge of any, uh, I think a, a lot of the uh, new, newfangled or newly popular educational practices like peer assessment, flipped classrooms, things like that, uh, you know, online education is, it takes both teaching staff and students a huge amount of time uh, and it's it's easy for that to be uh, a problem. And I think that um, part of what we're doing is we need to build a world where teachers know how to teach in, in this new regime and students know how to learn. And um, the I think giving good feedback to peers is a really valuable skill, not an easy one. Uh, and we're working on both the learning materials and the uh, technical plumbing to make that uh, to make that better. Uh, and the fortune cookies are one step there, because if it's difficult and time consuming, having some things that you can just drop in uh, helps. And in online education, to your question about effort, the answer to any question about effort is it varies insanely widely. I mean, the dynamic range goes from uh, I clicked on the button to sign up, which is th th that single click constitutes half of all of the giant numbers that you see in the New York Times in terms of the, the sign-ups. And then at the other end, you get students like Chandra Muli who are using an online class as a, uh, a springboard to do a multi-year project. I've seen a number of uh, Kickstarter projects have come out of my class and startups and a bunch of other cool stuff. And so the, the diversity in effort is really huge. Yeah, Amy. Oh. oh, sorry. Uh, just quickly, could you talk about how peer assessment affected self-assessment in terms of its quality and nature? Um, our experience, we've run a few, we've run a few studies on this, and um, my sense is that Let's see, so we've looked at this in a couple of different domains, and, and we've seen done this in crowdsourcing too, uh, that uh, reflecting on your own work after you've rated other people's works, this is true not just in learning context, but in, in, in other kinds of crowd work context as well, um, improves the quality of your, of your self-rating. That, that, uh, and I think we could actually see this for conference paper reviews. I think when we're in a submitting mindset, we're like, man, I'm a genius. And then when we're, we're reviewing mindset, we're like, what are these idiots doing? 
Uh, and then I, I w I've been program committee chair, and it's amazing how uh, the community will uh, applaud their submissions, tear each other's reviews apart, and then go to the bar and turn to the person who just wrote them the terrible review, unbeknownst to them, of course, and, and be like, I can't believe those idiot reviewers. How come they don't understand my genius? And the person sitting next to you is like, yeah, I can't believe that either. But of course, it's the same people. And I have a hunch that uh, if uh, one thing that you get out of self-assessment is not only uh, a sort of better perspective on your own work, but a real empathy for uh, the work that, that other people are doing, because you realize, oh, yeah, right, that's actually really hard, and so I don't want to just dismissively be like, well, why didn't you do the thing? Um, so I, I, think, I, I think that would be really interesting uh, in a professional context as well. Yeah, Chinmay has a comment also. I would address this to either of you. Uh, I was interested in the slide that had the discussion boards comparison, Duke, Stanford, UCSD, Wesleyan, et cetera. And you said that your team had done something very wrong in getting discussion boards going. And I've been um, absolutely just devastated and disappointed in trying to do this in my own classes. So if you can share any wisdom about um, how to do this better kind of analog way in a, in a face-to-face -face classroom, that would be wonderful. And these numbers are actually for participation in small group video discussions. So this is a, a little bit different. So um, there are lots of collaborative tools available online, and students use all of them. So uh, we've seen really large Twitter pickup. Uh, students flock to the forums and share work and discuss ideas and argue with each other there. Um, and then this is for the small group video discussions. Um, my sense of, we can talk more offline about, uh, about in-classroom discussions. The one thing that I've seen is it is extremely important to start at the beginning of class. Uh, so for my uh, graduate class, we have students lead discussions. So each student is responsible for leading or co-leading one discussion over the quarter. And one year I was really busy and uh, a crummy student led the first discussion. And the whole quarter was miserable. Uh, it was just no fun, there was no recovering. And uh, so now I always make sure to get somebody who I know will do uh, a really good job. This year I, I asked uh, Richard uh, Tibbles, who many of you know, to lead the first discussion, and he did an amazing job in my class. And that set the tone for great discussions throughout the course. Uh, so I think that get day one right is probably the most important thing to do. All right, thanks very much. And I'll be around afterwards for any other questions you might have.